Cifuentes. Welcome, Jesse. <clears throat> and again, everyone, um, for all of, of those of you joining, please let us know where, what city you're located. And if you can hear us, I'm going to get started here pretty soon. Thank you, Jesse. So yes, you can hear us. You're here at Fairfield. Great, great, Jesse. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to this workshop or, or webinar that Ionic, Ionic and Wendy has been so grateful to put together, right? Uh, as part of the uh, Salon Hispanic Chamber trainings that we want to be doing. And uh, it's same trying to connect. Uh, hopefully, I didn't maybe it lose me. Can you yeah, see it's cut out for a second for me. Okay. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> All right. So before we go into introductions, I just want to uh, go over a few um, items, right? Like house cleaning item items. So first thing for everybody, if you as you're joining, uh, if you can make sure you put yourself on mute, you'll be able to ask questions on the chat section if you want to through their presentation. Also, towards the end, we're going to have an area, a section for Q&A, right, questions and answer, where you can actually unmute yourself if you prefer to. Uh, but for now, if you can please uh, mute yourself um, or, or reduce background, uh, noise background, that'd be great. And um, again, if you do not know where the chat section is, let me know, mute yourself. Let us know as well if you can hear us, if you have any issues hearing us, please speak up. Um, all right, so let's get started with this. So the topic for today's webinar is gonna be that, I've been changing this a little bit, so I apologize to everyone. <laughs> so let's, 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 let's call it uh, three important steps, right, that we as business owners need to protect our business information. Um, and again, the uh, Ionic has been so grateful to go ahead and uh, join us today and talk about it and, 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 and the one doing the presentation will be Wendy, who I'm going to be talking about it, about her a little bit more. Uh, but to give you a quick uh, recap on the agenda of today, right, we, um, we're we going to be doing a little bit more introductions, telling you about Wendy. Um, then we're going to hand it over to Wendy to tell us more about uh, her story and tell us more about Ionic. Uh, then we dive in into the presentation. And after that, we go into questions, Q&A, and then uh, some closing remarks. All right, so with that, I want to introduce everyone to Wendy Howell, uh, CTO for Ionic, and she's been, uh, a little bit about her background and working experience, right? She's been in the IT industry since 2004, so wow, that's almost, what, uh, 15 years of experience in the yes. industry? Uh, both as a consultant and positions within educational institutions. She also holds a master's degree of science, system and network management, uh, and a, number, a, a, a large number of uh, certifications related to the <laughs> infrastructure technical industry. And um, I want to share a quote that you put over here on, on, your, on your site. It's like, and it says, like most fields, Technology is changing every day. That's very true. <laughs> Instead of being overwhelmed, this excites me because it allows me to grow. I, 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 I like that, Wendy. Um, technology lets me push myself in ways I never expected could bring me so much satisfaction. Or, sorry, technology lets me push myself in ways I never expected, expected could bring me so much satisfaction. The unending ability to learn more and to consistently accomplish newer and better ways to help people use technology is what makes me excited for me. So as you can see, Wendy not only has a number of years of experience, right, uh, but also the passion that she has for helping um, her clients with technology or to overcome technology. But um, that's not, let's not um, get this any further. It's not about Wendy, right? It's about the information that we can provide you today, but uh, we still want to recognize Wendy and acknowledge her, appreciate her for being here. So Wendy, we, before we start it, I'd like to now with your own words, tell us a little bit about how you got to become so cool uh, and a little bit about uh, Ionic 
uh, story. Okay. So um, Leo mentioned quite a few things already, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Leo. I appreciate that. And yes, I have been working in IT for about 15 years, and combined, um, Chris Taylor, if you've probably met him at a mixer, him and I uh, run this business together, we own it together, and we have been combined in this field for 40 years. So as Jesse mentioned, did I start in kindergarten? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Chris did start at a very young age. It was a huge passion project for him, and uh, that's how we met. We had would never have met had I not gotten into the tech field. So I'm super appreciative for all the things that that has brought into my life. Um, tech for me was something that I fell in love with because it changed all the time. And I love being challenged and that's in my quote because it really is a huge part of who I am. It's a big part of what I do every day and where I am every day is uh, feeding my brain. And it's just what is my passion and what makes me who I am. So tech was the perfect solution for me because I had been in positions where they didn't exist before. A lot of the jobs that I had before this job were positions that didn't exist. And so I would come in and I would assess, what does this position need to be? And what do I need to do? How can I make it amazing? And then eventually I'd get to a place where it was sort of running itself because I had policies in place and things were working and people knew what was expected and I knew what I was doing. And then, then what? And then a lot of times there weren't places to move up. And so for me, it, was, it would be the time to move on and turn it over to somebody else who could then just run it. And so when I ran into tech, it was like, wow, there's never an end because there's always something new coming out and something new to um, be sharing with our clients or some new feature we can expose them to. So for me, tech was like the perfect answer to something I had been searching for a long time. So that's a big part of that for me. Um, Ionic Systems was already in existence and um, that was Chris Taylor's baby and when we got together we joined up together and uh, just sort of took it from there and we've been doing it together since 2008 I think so it's been like 11 or 12 years that we've been working together and um, a lot of people think we're crazy for that but we love it because <laughs> we are uh, business partners and life partners so um, for us it's perfect but um, yeah, I think we, I think we're really good yin and yang because we're really good at different things and we're curious about different things. So different things feeds our desire for that. So today um, I wanted to talk to you about some things that will help protect your business. Um, it's a huge part of what we do at Ionic. The biggest thing we can do for you is protect your business. And so that's where everything we do sort of stems from that from one way or shape or form. It may be from the equipment, it may be from the data side, but basically everything we do is driven from the, the part of we have to help you protect your business because if we don't help you protect your business, you're not going to have a business. So that's where I'll begin. Sounds great. Sounds great. So the three major things that I want to talk about today are how to protect your data, how to protect your devices and how to properly destroy data. And that one's really important and I'll hit on it pretty hard because most people don't consider it. So I really want you to pay attention to that section. So those are the three biggest things that, that we're going to focus on today. And the three biggest things that I think are probably the most critical to your business. And the thing I think is important is that when you're running your business, you're not always thinking about the tech piece of it because you're busy running your business and we get that. Um, a big part of what we do is we work with enterprise businesses and we see how big of IT staffs they have. And what happens is small and medium businesses often are left behind because they don't have the money or the need to have full-time tech staff. And we can appreciate that because it is expensive, but you still need to have protections in place. So what we try to do is bring some of our enterprise perspective to the small and medium business in chunks that you can absorb and that you can apply get a big bang for your buck, but it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. So it's kind of where a huge part of our heart is focusing on small, medium businesses because we know that there's a big gap between what's provided for enterprise business, what's available, and what small, medium business is the attention that they get. And it's not as great as it should be. So, so as far as data protection, there is probably a lot more data that belongs to your business than you think. Sometimes it's going to be even scattered across different devices. Um, you, may have, uh, you may have a computer and then one of your employees uses a laptop or you might have 20 computers, you might have a server. It doesn't really matter how many pieces of hardware you have, it's a matter of knowing where your data lives. Where does it live? Where did you get it? How much do you have? What do you need? Like if, if a laptop goes down or say you have one computer runs your business and it crashes, what are you gonna do? Can you still run your business? 
So we all need things for our businesses. If you're, say, an auto repair shop, you're going to need parts to work on cars. You need tools to work on cars. But you also need records. You need client information. You need to know what you're billing your clients. Have they paid? What taxes did you pay? What expenses did you have? All those things are still part of your business and help you run your business. But they're just as critical, but they often get forgotten because they're sort of just running in the background, right? Your computers are just running in the background and you're not really thinking about what all lives there. You may have logos for your business that don't live anywhere else, but you might have paid hundreds of dollars to have somebody develop it. There's lots of things that are property of your business that are often stored on computers that sometimes we forget to back up or to protect. So a big part of protecting your business is protecting your data, whatever that may be. It might be lots of data, it might be a little amount of data, but it comes down to knowing what data you have, whether it's like client information or tax information or marketing stuff, but knowing where it lives. So do you have it on a computer? Is it across multiple computers? Do you have a centralized location where everybody accesses it from? It's important to know where it is because that's how you know how to protect it. If you don't even know where it is, then you're gonna have a really hard time recovering if something happens. So a big part of what we do is we ask the what if questions. What are you gonna do if the device that runs your business fails? That could be hard drive crashing, it could be a solid state drive crashing, it could be bad memory and the computer won't boot, it could be a myriad of things. But whatever it is, do you have a plan if that happens? What are you gonna do? Uh, what if somebody breaks into your uh, establishment and you have a brick and mortar business and someone breaks in and they steal your computer? What are you gonna do now? Like, where's all your client data? You know, have you thought about how you will operate your business that day when you walk in and it's missing? So those are the kinds of questions that we have to ask you. It's a pain point, right? It's a, it's a balance between protecting and having something set in place to recover and not spending money you don't need to spend. So you have to find the common ground or that, that sweet spot in between how much pain it's gonna cost you to have your business down versus how much it's gonna cost to protect yourself from going down. So that's a big part of what we do is we help you look at what are your risks? How much risk do you have? And can we reduce some of that risk? And what would that cost if we were to try to do that? So sometimes it's a matter of sort of a la carting it, right? You, I'm gonna, choose to implement this, but I'm going to skip on this one over here because that's a little bit costly for my budget right now. And we totally understand that every business has a budget. We have a budget too, so we, we understand that. Um, but it's a big part of understanding the risk you're taking if you're not planning. Because if you aren't planning, you're going to get caught unaware. And it is much more costly to replace equipment when you haven't planned ahead. If you plan ahead, and you say, I have a computer at six years old, I need to replace that. Then you have time to figure out what software you use that's been downloaded on that computer, find out if you need to upgrade the software, get the software itself, the licensing keys, the data, and you have all the time to plan ahead. Move everything over to the new computer and test and make sure that it's actually what you're expecting and that it's working the way you're expecting it to. And if it's not, you still have the old computer to go back to and you can look and say, what setting did I miss or why isn't this working or where's that file? Or where's that template that I always use for all my bills and QuickBooks? And you still have time to copy it. If you wait till that computer crashes, it's going to cost you so much more money to try to recover the data. So then you either have to recreate the data or pay someone to recover it, which can cost thousands of dollars. So planning ahead saves you money if you do it right. So that's why we ask a lot of those questions. Um, I have this little image here about ransomware. And so ransomware is an attack where somebody infects your computer and typically they send you an email and you click on something you shouldn't. And it encrypts all your files on your computer. And it's, it's hitting smaller businesses more. It hits the health industry bigger than any other industry because there's the most amount of data to collect and money. But the average company takes them 33 hours to recover. So if you own a business, What's 33 hours cost you? It's lost employee time. It's potentially lost sales, lost service. Um, and also it's loss of reputation. And that's one of the things you have to consider because often businesses forget that their reputation is at risk as well. So that's important. So next. Um, the other Whitney, thing before, uh, real quick. Um, oh, sure. Before going back to what you were saying in reference to protecting the 
um, you know, the, the disasters, what, what could happen, right? What if, what, um, are you going into some details perhaps of, uh, uh, some different scenarios or, or situations later on, or, or, or perhaps if people as ask. As far as natural disasters or disasters in general? Uh, like if a person has one computer, uh, what are some of the technology that is available now for a small business owner that only has one computer um, and then something happens to that computer, something breaks? What technology okay. is available now to sort of recover faster? Um, so there's a couple things and there are things that I'll, all things I'll talk about a little later, but I'll cover that now quickly. Um, the biggest things are you got to have copies of your data offsite. It has to be an offsite location in case something happens local. Um, if you have a USB drive plugged into that computer and the computer, I don't know, is in a fire or somebody steals it, that USB drive is gone too. So you don't really have a copy of your data. So it absolutely has to be offsite if you only have one computer. The second thing is you need endpoint protection. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about protecting your devices. Endpoint protection, if done right, if you get the right service, will actually protect you from ransomware. It'll allow you to roll back the computer to the day before. So there's layers of security and the protection that you need. You need backups in case the physical hardware fails and it's not like a ransomware thing where you're just trying to get you know, your files back. So there's physical hardware that can happen. There's also a natural disaster or theft, right? So you need copies of your data for that. Mm -hmm. But you also need endpoint protection because if your computer gets hit with a virus or a Trojan or a worm or you're trying to uninstall that and get all that off your computer, it could take days and you may never actually get all of it off. So you need that protection to help you recover the computer, and then you need the data protection to recover the data. So those two pieces together are the two pieces you absolutely have to have, and they're very reasonably priced. You know, you can get a, a cloud backup plan for $25 a year, um, which is a really small price to pay for that kind of protection, right? So you definitely want to have those two together because the two kind of work, tandem, work in tandem. You're not really sure what's going to happen, but with those two alone, you can suffer a hardware failure and recover. You can suffer, um, a, you know, a virus, a ransomware, Trojan, a worm, any of those kinds of attacks. You can recover, um, even you know, any of those kinds of things. You can still recover from. And I think that's the biggest thing is being able to say, I could go buy a computer off the shelf, install software, download my data, and boom, I'm ready to rock and roll. You could, you know, what I'm saying, you can get that done within a short period of time and get your business back up and running. Got it. So definitely, I'm interested to know more about the point-to-point -point encryption once you get to it, but the data. It's the other one that you were big in, in, in covering. Yeah. And please, everybody, let us know uh, if you can still hear us and if you can still make, if this is helpful, right, to understand the what if questions. Uh, comment, yes, if you uh, can still hear us and if you can still, if that was valuable uh, or helpful uh, to you. Okay. You will still hear? Did answer your question, Leo? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. I just want to make sure, sure that people can still hear us, people can still. Or I've already put them to sleep. It's hard to tell. <laughs> We're still here. Yes, Michael oh, yeah, said yes. Yeah, yeah. Great, okay. great, 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 great. All right, so okay. yes, thank you, Wendy. Let's continue. Sure. So the biggest thing about um, protecting your backup, your data, is you have to have backups. I mean, we stress this with every client we have. We absolutely think everyone has to have this. Even if you're just somebody who has, like, say you have all your family history photos forever, you should have that stored somewhere other than one place. Because you, if you don't, you are risking not having it at some point. You're basically, it, it could happen at any time, you just never know. So there's two types of backups. Um, there's local backups, like with a USB drive, like I kind of mentioned a minute ago, and then there's cloud backups. And there are two very different types of backups, and there are different reasons you would do both, um, and they're both valuable. I lean more towards a cloud backup because it protects you from more things, um, but not everybody's comfortable putting their stuff in the cloud. I would say that's become, it's become more and more common to have things in the cloud and knowing that it's in the cloud, you have a better, you reduce your liability. Basically, if you have an, a cloud backup plan, the liability for protection, you set up your plan and boom, it's protected. If you have a local drive, like a USB drive, it's a lot more manual of a process. So you have to remember to swap drives. You have to remember to take them to an offsite facility. You have to remember to check them. And you don't get the same benefits out of them. Um, I see, yes, he's got a question. If it's in the cloud, what are the risks of getting hacked? Um, I would say it depends on the software. Um, as far as having, um, if you have, okay, let me back up for a second. 
So a cloud backup plan is different than cloud storage. Cloud storage would be like Google Drive or Box and things like that. Some of those files, like say Dropbox, where you have a folder on your desktop and you put your files in it and then it loads up to the cloud. Most people have probably heard of that. If you're using that and your local computer gets hacked, it's not really the cloud that's gonna get hacked, it's more that your local computer got hacked and those files could potentially be at risk. When you're using cloud backups, there's not like, it's backing up whatever files you've selected and it's not really the cloud that's gonna potentially get hacked, it's still, again, once it's really more your computer that's more likely to get hacked. Doesn't mean a cloud camp company can't get hacked because you're reading about this in the, in the news all the time all over the place. So, Anyone can get hacked in essence, right? It's like anyone's car could get stolen. It's out there. There are random people walking by. It could happen, but there are ways to reduce your risk. Um, I would say using different user IDs and passwords is a huge way um, to keep yourself more protected and to keep your liability reduced. If you use the same user IDs and passwords in all different kinds of accounts, then if somebody hacks an account and you don't know about it, they could turn around and use those credentials on one of your cloud accounts. So in essence, there is always going to be risk. It's partially how you use it and how you implement it. So that, hopefully that answers Jesse's question. Um, so getting back to local drives versus cloud drives, um, if you use a local USB drive, the big thing that you have to know is that when you copy data, you don't, you either have to copy all of it, and then the next time you copy it over, it like replaces files, or you copy all of it again. So Picture that in your mind, like as a building block, all your data, one big block, and then again, one big block, and another big block. There's a lot of redundancy, and it's not very efficient storage, right? A cloud backup is going to move all your files at once, and then after that, it's gonna be incremental. So it's gonna be file differences or new files. So it's not gonna be like all of your files all the time. So it's much more efficient, one, over the internet because it's not backing up all your files all the time. It's just what's changed and what's new. And two, the storage is way more efficient. So it's a little bit um, more automatic, more automated, I would say. A cloud backup is much more automated than a local backup. So USB backup, if you leave it on site, you also risk the fact like theft and things like that. If you use cloud backups and your laptop gets stolen, like say you're traveling, it doesn't matter. You can log into your backup account and you can pull down whatever you need to pull down and you're right back in business. So if you get a new laptop. So we had this happen with a client one time, they were headed to a conference to present and their laptop crashed somehow along the way. So I don't know if somebody picked it up and didn't set it down right or whatever, but they couldn't get it to boot. So they ran to a Staples, bought a laptop, logged into their account, pulled their um, presentation down because it was part of their backups and presented at the conference. So the only thing that they had frustration with was that they had to go buy a new laptop. So um, initial backup takes longer. Yes, you are correct. So the response here was the initial backup takes longer, but after that it's faster because only new or revised information gets updated. That is absolutely correct. You are correct. So it's, it's very efficient after it's run the first time. Um, so anyway, so if you have cloud backups, if something happens, you can recover much more quickly. You just need internet access. That's it. Where a local backup, if something were to happen to the, the laptop and say you left your backup somewhere else, which you should if it was a USB drive, because you don't want all of your data in one place where something bad could happen, um, but then you can't recover because you don't have access to it because now you're not there. So it's a little more clunky using um, a local backup. What we found with people who really, really insist on using them is that they often don't remember to actually back up the data. So they plug them into the computer and it sits there and then nothing. <laughs> they forget to copy the files over and actually back up their data. So something will happen and we'll go, hey, how? let's use your backup. And they're like, oh, well, the last date was like four months ago and I, you know, I've updated QuickBooks every day since then. So that backup is in essence useless. It's not really a backup. So those are the things, oops, sorry, those are the things that I would recommend against using a USB drive. Those are kind of the reasons why, because unless you're somebody who can set um, like a reminder and do it every day or every week, depending upon how much your data changes, and you're really, really, really diligent about it, it often doesn't get done. So just keep that in mind. That's what we've run into a lot in the field. Those are the, some of the issues we've had with people who try to do it themselves because they have the right intentions, but it's that follow through. 
Um, and the last thing I'll say about local USB drives is if you choose to use this way, make sure that every time you actually run a backup, you unplug it from your computer. Because if you get hit with ransomware, which will encrypt the files on your computer, it will encrypt any locally attached devices. So if you leave your backup plugged in, now both of them are encrypted and they're absolutely useless to you. So that's one really big thing to know about local drives is that ransomware yeah. will wipe it out too. So that's, that's big, Wendy. So unplug it if you're seeing local backup, unplug it because yeah. otherwise you, you may get attacked. Now, what if one of those files had affected that got backed up? Um, would it be would would it matter? Would it be affected the backup in the local uh, thumb drive or USB drive? If the, say that again, if the what? If if, if one of the files is affected uh -huh. uh, uh, with with ransomware, or ransomware is more of a, an attack. Um, so ransomware hits all your files. So what happens is it's a program that runs and it basically encrypts every single file you have. So it, in other words, it puts a wrapper around it that without a password, you can't get into. And so it actually changes the um, extension on the end of the file name. So like with Word, you have like dot, um, docx or Excel is like XLS, right? Um, it changes it to an encrypted extension and you, in essence, either paid them to get the decryption key. And again, you're basically working with thieves. So if you pay them, they may or may not give you the key and it may or may not be the right one. So some people have had that happen or they've been reinfected because they've already been infected once, right? So I try to always tell people, plan ahead so you never have to pay them because if we stop paying them, they'll stop making money and they'll go away. They keep doing it because they're making money. So if people would protect in advance, then they would not have to pay that. And then those people would eventually, because they're making, it's thieves, they're making money. So that's why they're doing it. Um, and it's unfortunate because not everybody can afford it, um, even if they wanted to. So you really want to try to not have to pay that. Definitely. I've seen, um, I, I found some, uh, a YouTube channel of a guy that records himself uh, actually um, pranking these uh, ransomware attackers or, or, or hackers, right? But mm -hmm. I, I do get to hear a lot of uh, the things that goes on between that world. What you mentioned is basically people that are teased, basically they, they somehow they get into your computer and, and lock your files unless you pay them. And a lot of them, because they're overseas, some of the techniques that I hear them use are go to your local Walmart store, get a $500 gift, dollar gift card, or get two $500 gift cards. And then right. that's how you can pay you so we can let your files go so we can give your files back so very interesting thank you for, for that. the other thing that they do is they'll try to get you to pay in bitcoin because it's not it's not like governmentally managed same with the gift cards you can't really track that down to like a single entity of so the person who's the attacker mm -hmm. and bitcoin's the same way so those are the kinds of ways they're going to request payments or make you make payments that way mm. so definitely it's, it's it's bad news that's for sure so if you have cloud backups, uh, this is kind of what Leo was asking a little bit, it helps you, here's the ways that it can help you. You can restore a single document, you can restore a folder, you can restore all of the files you've ever backed up at one time, you can open or download a file on another computer, even not even in the computer that you backed up from. So say like the instance, I, the example I gave of where somebody went to do a presentation and their laptop broke on the way, they just logged in because it's a it's a, um, a online interface. You log into your account and you pull down whatever you need to. So you can open it or you can download it. You can revert a file back to a previous version. So this has happened to me before where I made a change to a website page and then it broke something. And it was faster to just recover the previous page than to figure out where I had missed the semicolon, right? So the same thing with like QuickBooks. Say you made a mistake in QuickBooks and I use QuickBooks because it can be kind of tedious at times and if you make a mistake sometimes it's hard to unwind it like you're trying to figure out how did that get there and how do i undo it so you could just revert back to quickbooks from the day before when your backup ran um, or you can recover an accidentally deleted file this happens all the time people delete files like especially big businesses where they're sharing files with a bunch of people and everyone has the same full access um, but even if you're a small business and you have two people this can happen. Somebody deletes something because they think it's a copy or they don't think it's the original and it's gone. You know, how can you get that back? If the if it's not in the recycle bin, especially shared drives are famous for that, they don't go in a recycle bin, they're gone. 
So um, you definitely, this is how you can recover those. A lot of times what's happened and what happened to me one time is somebody thought it would be really funny to delete a bunch of my files and they put them in my recycle bin. And I have a, a habit of always emptying out my recycle bin because I know it takes up storage. And you know, if I delete it, I delete it for a reason. So I wiped out my recycle bin, not knowing it was, this was at a job. I had worked for another, with another tech person and they oh, thought no. it'd be really funny. Oh. And I deleted a bunch of my files and I had no way to get them back. And I was so upset mm -hmm. because it was really dramatic. I had all these things that he had wiped out. And so it's things like that. Sometimes you're just not thinking and you're, you know, you're just maintaining the computer by emptying the recycle bin and then something horrible happens to you. So it's definitely better to have that protection in place so you don't have to worry about it. So those are some of the things that like having cloud backups can help you recover from. Those are the situations definitely. you can recover. Definitely. And Jesse mentions over here, um, she, yes, oh. staff or even yourself can easily delete an important document. Yes, uh, sure. yes, very, very true. She says yeah. that she used to have a schedule backups uh, happening daily and eventually forgot uh, and unplug it and got attacked. So now she's like in the idea of evolving to the next level of cloud. Yeah. So thank you, Jesse, for those great comments. Um, that's great. So then the next thing you want to talk about, so that's sort of like data protection. So data protection is basically all about protecting the data that runs your business that is your business, right? Because your data is your business, your clients, right? Everything you do. Um, the second thing that I think is really important and isn't a lot of, doesn't take a lot of business um, infrastructure to implement is to protect your devices. And this is that endpoint protection that I mentioned earlier. And there's been kind of an evolution of device protection. Uh, most of you have probably heard of antivirus software, right? 10 years ago, everything was antivirus software, semantic antivirus, Norton antivirus. Everybody had it, everybody heard about it, McAfee. Then slowly over time, it started being called anti-malware. And people were like, what's the difference? And everyone's like, well, we don't really know, but they're both bad. And I would say the big difference is anti-malware, the idea of that software is to cover more things than just a virus. So there are viruses, there are worms, there are trojans, there's ransomware, there's all kinds of threats that come at you. And you don't necessarily have to understand what they all are, how they all work. Um, most of them require some sort of interaction on your side and it's not intentional. A lot of it comes from emails where somebody's pretending to be somebody else and they say like, oh, you know, I need you to click on this or, or it might be like, oh, I'm your bank, you know, and I, you know, I need you to update your account and you click a link and it looks like you went to Wells Fargo, but it's not Wells Fargo. And so a lot of these things happen because we click on things that someone else has set up and devised to trick us. And it's very easy to fall victim to these. I know this happens to people that we know, friends and family, business people. Um, and it's especially true when we're busy because when we're busy, we're not taking as much time to think about, wait, should I click on that? <laughs> and it happens to the best of us. You, you click on something, you're like, oh, I probably should have clicked on that. What was that? <laughs> And so a lot of times what I tell people to do is um, if you're on your phone, you can click and hold on a link and it'll tell you where it's really going because it'll say, I'm going to Bank of the West login. But on the backside, it's too long to explain, but the programming on the backside is it can really be going anywhere. And so you don't realize it because you're just reading the language that they want you to see. In an email, if you use your mouse cursor and you hover over the email or the link, it'll tell you where that's going. And the same thing with the email address that sent it to you. It might say it's from your boss or it could say it was from Leo to me, but if it looks suspicious and I hover over and it's some random email that I know isn't Leo, then I'm not going to open that. I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna click on any links. So those are some of the ways you can protect yourself like in the, in the immediate, like the right this second, those are things you can do to protect yourself because that's how we get most of the things that happen to our devices, most of the malware things. Um, the other place you get them is on the internet, um, and a lot of times they come from bad ads. So there's a lot of ads that come up that have um, malware in them and program in them. And unfortunately, there are lots of people that target children. So if you have kids that use your computers and you log in as the same login as them, then you're probably an admin. Now they're an admin. So if they click on, oh yeah, I want to install the little smiley thing or this little game, it might be something bad but if you create a separate login for them that's not an admin and they have to ask your permission to install software you'll be a lot more protected um, we always recommend that you keep like a business computer separate from like a family computer because you want to protect your files you want to protect your clients 
Um, that's not a conversation you want to have to have with your clients that like potentially their data got that's hacked. Right. Um, so that's a really good, yeah, it's a really good, a really good principle, but we know a lot of times it happens. We're like, oh, they were just doing homework and, and we totally understand. So create a second user account so that they're not using an admin account. That's a good way to protect yourself. Um, but the most important way to protect yourself is to use what's now called endpoint protection. So endpoint is basically an endpoint device. It's, you know, your laptop, it's your computer. It's that device that's connected to your network, even if it's just your home network, that you do business on. And so that's considered endpoint. So endpoint protection, many of the services now actually cover um, ransomware because it has become such a targeted a targeted attack. You know, it's happening more and more and more. And every year there's more instances of it. And it's so many numbers, it would make your head spin. So I didn't put too many um, of those in here because it literally will make your head spin. But what you should know is that 60% of businesses that small companies that get hit with cyber attack, uh, they close within six months. And that can include more than ransomware. But that's really important because we're a small company and probably many of the people on this call are small companies. And we're getting targeted, one, because we probably don't have the same protection in place as an enterprise company because it's expensive. It can be really expensive to have the really high-end firewalls and the content filters and the email fil content filtering. It's a lot. And um, it's a lot to even understand as a small business. And many small businesses don't need full IT staff. So instead, what you do is you back up your data <laughs> and then you have endpoint protection. So endpoint protection helps you in real time. So if you have it installed on your computer, it's going to say when you go to click on something, you know, I don't trust that installer or I don't trust where this company's coming from or this isn't a secure site or this um, SSL cert, like when you go to a website and it has that little, um, the little lock key, so you know it's secure to send your data, it's encrypted, doesn't match who this company says it is. And that right there is a dead giveaway that it's probably not the right site. So you want to stay away from it. So the endpoint protection helps you know when those things are happening. So it can't stop you if you say, I want it anyway. <laughs> like It's not going to like stop you for the most part. But what it does is it lets you know so you can make that decision. It says, hey, you probably don't want to do this and this is why. Um, it'll also run in the background and remove bad mal uh, software. Or if it sees software that's doing something that it appears to be malware-like, um, like it's taking up a lot of memory or it's sending a bunch of data, those are all um, consistent with something that would be malware related, it will shut that down. It'll stop letting it communicate, it'll stop the service, and it'll alert you. So it's in real time protecting you. It's trying to protect your computer. It'll um, monitor what you're doing and what's normal for your usage. And if it seems off, it'll try to figure out why. So more and more, there's a lot of learning, machine learning in the new endpoint protection that didn't used to be there. It used to be you would just get those um, virus updates and little update files, and it would look for what everybody already knew existed. New endpoint protection is actually looking at how you're using your computer, how software is operating, and does anything seem to be different? Is it, does it seem to be malware related? Is it doing things that don't seem like they're in your best interest, like sending off a bunch of data? Those are malware related things. So the newest stuff now will actually do little tiny snapshots and it'll let you roll your computer back to before a ransomware attack if you get hit with ransomware. So the, the newest ones will actually provide ransomware protection. And that is pretty brand new. Um, I think we've only been hearing about that for a couple months now. So that's, um, uh, it's huge for people who are small businesses, like you're saying, like, where you have one computer, and basically you can't afford to lose that one computer because it's running everything. Um, so that that's a really that's a really big one, and I'm super excited that that's now being included because it's uh, it takes so many hours to recover. It's so much work, and it can be really really expensive if you don't have somebody who can recover the device, you know, along with your data, aside from your data, but you got to get the malware off of there and you just go buy a new device, what does that cost you, like $1,000 maybe? You know, that's super expensive. So you wanna to try to avoid that if you can. Great, great, Wendy. So I'm curious, you know, I, I only have one computer, so I'm definitely okay. guilty on that. Uh, but I'm curious, <laughs> you know, anybody else that, uh, if you can comment on the chat sections, how many computers uh, you have on, uh, on it? And, and if you don't wanna say, that's fine, but do you have one more than one computer or just one? Yeah, it's a good question. 
And a lot of times people have multiple computers and all the data lives on one and other people access the data off that computer. They just have a little share. So it still comes down to you could get away with protecting just that one. If, you know, if money is really, really tight, just protect the one, but make sure you're protecting that one and that you have the data backed up because if you, it's such a risk if you don't. It really is. I mean, one which my laptop, but I also have a desktop for my staff. Yeah, so you have a couple. Um, and so, yeah, it's just really important to consider what would you do if the one you use every day is unavailable to you? That's what you have to consider. Like, what, how, how big of a cost is that to your business? Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, so we talked about data protection and um, device protection and then data destruction. So this is something that I would say is probably the most often overlooked um, critical piece of your business is whether you know it or not, when you're in business, you're responsible for the data that you collect. So if you are collecting information about people, whatever it may be, it could be um, credit cards or names, addresses, um, I know not social security numbers, I don't think most people collect that anymore, but um, anything that you collect about your clients, right? Uh, mailing addresses and preferences about things that they bought and purchases and money they've spent and things like that. You're responsible for maintaining the integrity of that data. And if something happens, depending upon what kind of data you collect, um, if somebody else were to get access to that data, you have to notify your clients that, hey, like your data was potentially hacked. And you've probably heard this in the news a lot. It's happened with Target and it's happened with Marriott and it's, Many, 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 I can't even, the list is too long. But it's because the company allowed someone else to get access, unauthorized access to their client's data, meaning us, the people that use them. And so you are also responsible for that as a business owner. And you don't want to ever have to make that call or you know share with people because it's really, really, really hard on your reputation. So in saying that, um, the endpoint protection helps with that a lot, but the last step of it is sort of like the last step in the data life cycle is when you have hard drives or computers that you're no longer using, the drives that are in them need to be professionally destroyed because even if they don't run, you can still recover data from them. So let me give you an example. If I take this book and I rip out the table of contents, and you can no longer see, like I couldn't just go in here and go, oh, I wanna go look at whatever, what page is that on? Does that mean that all these pages don't exist? They're still there. A hard drive works the same way. Your hard drive or your solid state drive, whatever you have in your computer, it works the same way. It works off of basically like a table. Um, it's called a file allocation table. And that's basically what tells a computer, this is where everything lives, where all your data lives, okay? So if some piece of that gets corrupted, it doesn't mean the data doesn't still live there. And it takes the simplest of tools to recover that data. So if you have an old computer and this happens a lot, people are like, oh, I'm gonna donate it, which seems like the right thing to do. It's a nice thing, I get it, instead of just throwing it in a landfill. Take the hard drive out first. Donate it, but take out the hard drive because people can get a new hard drive for like 50 bucks. And the Windows license usually is a tag on the computer itself, they can reuse that because it's still a valid license, but you protect your business. And then what you do is you get it professionally destroyed. So to destroy drives, there's two different drives now, you hear all the time hard drives and um, uh, solid state drives, those are the two big ones, right? Hard drives are old spinning platters, they're literally like round, like tiny little records, and they store stuff with a magnetic charge. So it's either an on or an off, that's how every little thing is stored. So they get destroyed differently. They actually have to be demagnetized and then crushed because the demagnetization basically wipes out all that data. And then solid state drives, because they're, um, they're almost more like memory, they have little chipsets, they actually have to be crushed like this. So if you can see that, that is a bunch of holes punched through a solid state drive where a hard drive gets crushed and looks like this when it gets done. So <laughs> So when you get them professionally destroyed, they end up looking like that. And the difference is that you have their NSA high-tech high and HIPAA certified, meaning you completely protect your business. And the responsibility of what's on those is it's done because it's been completely wiped out. It's, it's completely certified to not be able to be recoverable. That's what those standards are. So if you take it somewhere to get destroyed, make sure that they meet those three standards. It's HIPAA, high-tech, and NSA standards. After they get professionally destroyed, do we get them back? Uh, I don't think I've ever had anybody want them back. Usually, um, we end up recycling the, um, the metal. 
because the metal, some of the metal can be uh, like not recycled, but um, you know how you, when you get rid of them, uh, they'll live with electronics, right? Because electronic stuff a lot of times, kind of like batteries, you have to recycle them in a certain way. You can't just throw them in the garbage. So we recycle them that way. But if you want them back, you could always get them back. Uh, the last thing that goes with it is you want to get a certificate of destruction. And so the certificate of destruction should have the serial number of every drive that got destroyed. That's very important too, because that's your proof that you don't have the liability for the data on that drive anymore. That's your proof that you had somebody professionally destroy them to the point of not being able to be recovered. And so that's a big thing that gets missed because people think, especially, it's an electronic recycle. Yeah. Um, the big thing is that people don't think about the fact they're like, well, the computer doesn't boot. I can't get to my data, so nobody can. Well, that's a huge misnomer. <laughs> it's not that hard to get access to what's on there. Typically, it depends on what's wrong, but you can almost always recover data. So you don't want to like, you know, donate it to your kids or donate it to somebody else. You always want to wipe off your business data and start with a fresh drive, especially if you're donating. Just take the drive out completely, donate the computer, and anybody can go get a hard drive for like, literally like $50. So um, it's nice to donate, but you do want to be sure that you don't, actually um, give away proprietary information. It's something that it seems, it seems trivial, I guess. It's, it's like something you wouldn't even consider, but it's a huge deal and companies have gotten in big trouble in the past for donating lots of computers and then there was still data on them. So it's definitely something you want to consider. It's sort of like that last step of your data cycle. So the big, the big things are, I guess, the, the biggest three things that I would want you to go, get away with from this information is that you absolutely want to have a copy of your data. Um, in the data world, we say three is two and two is one and one is none. Meaning if you only have one copy of your data, you have none because if so, anything happens, you have none. Um, if you have two, you really only have one because if something happens, you only have the one, right? So you really need to have three. That way, no matter what happens, you have two. Um, and the big part of that is you absolutely have to check your backups. So if you tell me you have backups on a thumb drive, but you haven't checked or restored a couple of the files in the last six months, you don't have backups. Even with cloud backups, you need to log in and check your files every once in a while. Make sure that they are still there, that they work, that you can open them, that they're in the right state that they should be in. That's absolutely a critical piece of that. Um, and then device protection. You need endpoint protection to help you recover from and protect from, hopefully protect from and never have, uh, a malware infection or a ransomware infection. It's going to be critical in protecting your devices. And then data destruction. And if you have old drives or old laptops hanging around, absolutely. If you've ever done any sort of banking, even if it's not for your business, it's personal. If you've done online banking or you've stored files that had tax information or anything like that, you should get them professionally destroyed. That way you don't have to worry about data getting recovered from them. Does that wow. make sense? Wow, definitely. And hopefully you can give us some resources about destructions. Uh, I know probably you're, you do the same. Um, do you do, do it for business and okay. personal? What was that? Do you do it for businesses and personal? Or? We do. The data destruction? Yeah, the drives? Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we do, um, these are actually ones we've done, the examples I held up. We do hard drives and solid states. And that's the other thing I would say is if you're having it done and you have solid states, make sure that they also do solid states because it's different. It's a different mm. process. Mm. Yeah, so the example, you it was interesting to see. So you had to punch holes, a lot yeah. of little holes to get instruction. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if you can see, like, so this is what the back of that looks yes. like. This is the solid state drive that got crushed. Yes. So the holes go all the way through. So it's a different mm. attachment that actually comes down and, and literally punches holes through mm. every little chipset because the data is completely different the way it's stored. The technologies are very different. Mm -hmm. And that's why solid states, they um, respond so much faster. They boot faster when you have computers that have those because the data is stored differently. It's completely different. So you have to destroy them differently. Yeah, I haven't checked how is it, but uh, I've seen in the regular drives, right? It has like a little disk where... Yeah, the, the it's kind of hard to see, it. but you can kind of see right here, there's like um, a little round disk right here. That's the disk. It's just completely bent. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, they used to stack platters, and you would open a hard drive, and they would have three or four of those stacked up with little readers in between that look like um, really old record player readers, right? Because they're reading those magnetization. They're reading the pluses or minuses, the zeros or ones. And so it would just crush all those platters. But most of them now, they squeeze so much storage onto them that you should only have one, one platter in there. But you still mm -hmm. got to demagnetize those. Where the solid states, you mm -hmm. don't have to demagnetize, you just crush. Mm -hmm. But it's different process, so you would want them to be, you want to know Definitely. that they've been handled and 
they like the right process. Yeah, definitely. So, so I think we this is a great time for uh, any more uh, Q and A's, right, Wendy? Same. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great. So, a uh, little reminder for everybody: if you like to um, actually uh, ask a question live, right? Let us know. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself, but if you have an issue, you mute yourself. Um, let us know in the chat section, or you can simply ask in the chat section if you don't feel like asking. Um, question. So it looks like Jesse has a question there. Data Goodbye. protection, data, vice protection, and data destruction. Yes, those are the. Let's see. Oh, can you please, as a let's see, as a professional that works on these situations daily basis, can you please provide suggestions, provide vendors, for, or providers for these? Okay. So um, there's lots of different people that do all of these. Um, we actually provide all of these services as, as well. So device. And so then we started documenting and I was like, wow, I should really turn this into a blog so we could reach more people than just the two of us. So lots of times people will say, hey, I had this happen. How do I fix it? And I'll send them a link to my blog and say, try this. And if you get stuck, let me know. And it's a way of helping you help yourself. And also I can just reach so many more people with it because it's, out in the world. So um, if you're interested in that, you can go to blogs.ionic.com and subscribe there. And then also for coming to this webinar, um, we have a promo code and it's um, SHCC Web one And if you want, you can get up to five drives crushed professionally, like I discussed earlier, or you can get six months free with an annual cloud backup plan. So we have plans that start at $25 a year. They're really reasonably priced um, and they're basically based on how much storage you need. So how much data do you have? Um, so those are the two big things that we have uh, that we provided for coming to the webinar as a, as a thank you for coming to the webinar. And, and does anybody have any other questions? I wasn't sure. I was, I, hopefully I didn't miss any. I know, yes, he was typing a couple things and I was trying to scan it as I was going. Um, I don't know if I answered this one yet. So the initial backup for cloud backups does take a little longer, depends upon um, typically, it depends upon your internet speed. So if you have a pretty fast plan and you don't have a whole lot of data, it'll, it'll zoop up in like an hour. It might even be less. If you have a ton of data and not very fast internet speed, you can imagine it's like a closet, right? If you have really small closet doors and you want to try to get a ton of stuff in, it's going to take a while. But if you have bigger closet doors and not that much, you're in and out really quickly. So it's kind of like that. It's dependent a little bit upon how much data you have as well as how much, um, how fast your internet speed is. So those things can change. Um, so that is, but yeah, but after that, it goes pretty quickly. Usually the backups um, are done within anywhere from like three minutes to 20 minutes. And it depends on if you have an in-use database file. If you have an in-use database file like QuickBooks, which I have every day, um, it takes about 15 minutes. Let's see here, something else. Um, I believe I'll contact you later to discuss. Okay, that sounds great. I'll be around. Uh, and I think that's it. So thank you everybody for attending. If you have any questions, again, you can email me at any time or um, if you have, visit our website or subscribe to my blog. So I hope that we, uh, hope I get some new subscribers. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching and thank you for Leo, to Leo for uh, setting this all up and hosting and to the chamber oh. for the opportunity. Sure, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. That's okay. <laughs> But yeah, thank you everyone, right, for attending. It, we hope definitely there was a, a, a very valuable information um, for all of those of you that are in the call. And yeah, Wendy, thank you for providing information, right? How can people get best get in contact with you? I see we have your website. And anyway, get some uh, promo code information. That's really great. Um, so that's all, that was all the questions. Anybody else had any more questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, See, so one of the things you mentioned, Wendy, is that if the computer will be donated, it says mm -hmm. that even if you do like one of those fully restore or, or delete, uh, the device is not even as best as to just get rid of the drive and take it to professionally be destroyed. Yeah, so usually those, like even like a DOD, a DOD wipe will work if the drive is running, but it takes days because what it does is it overwrites the data a certain amount of time, so it's absolutely unrecoverable. But like a, even if you just like reinstall Windows, what'll happen is it'll, it'll install the data consecutively, right? Because it's a fresh install. And then all the files that lived past that don't get overwritten because 
the file, the disk isn't in use. Mm -hmm. In other words, it'll write up, say, um, let's just say you had, let's say 25 blocks to make it make sense. And say it takes 12 to install Windows, but in, but before you're using 22. Well, the, mm -hmm. that 10, that difference is still gonna be there. So if somebody mm -hmm. had the right software and they knew how to do it, they could get to that data. Cause it mm -hmm. still lives there. It hasn't been overwritten. Okay, so that even if sense. we, yeah, even if we supposed to do a, a, a wipe out and reinstall, let's say window fresh, that data st may still live and- uh, It often is still there, yeah. There's no better. guarantee that it's not. Most of the time, some data can be recovered. Now, it's probably not gonna be everything, and it's not necessarily gonna be super easy, but if it got into the wrong hands, it absolutely, there'll be some data they could collect for sure. Yeah. And what would be your process to, let's say somebody that has a, um, a, a desktop, maybe the person is not technical savvy, but like, would like a service to get a professional destroy. Um, what, what, what is usually the process in those situations, a, a desktop, and but you know, somebody doesn't really know how to pull the, the drive out to bring it to you? Oh, right. Um, so we, um, when we do the drive destruction, most of the time we end up pulling the drives for the clients because they, like you said, they don't know how to do it or they're like, ah, I'm not sure what I should be doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or they don't have the tools. Sometimes it's having the right tools, uh, the size, the right size screwdrivers, et cetera, especially with laptops, to be able to get the drives out. So we can do that for you and we don't charge for that. Got it, got yeah. it. Thank you, very useful. For, so that's, that's uh, take us to the top of the hour. Uh, there's no more questions. Again, thank you everyone for uh, coming to the webinar today and thank you Wendy and Chris for <laughs> let us use your time, right? Um, thank you, Leo. Have a great day, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.